Good morning, everyone, um, and very warm welcome to this webinar, which we've called Personal Resilience in a Crisis, um, which SITFA is running in association with uh, CCLA. I'm Vivian Russell. I'm Head of Communications and Content at SITFA, and I'm going to be moderating today's discussion. Uh, before I introduce uh, the panellists, I just want to um, give you all a reminder that we do want this to be an interactive event. So I'm going to be encouraging you to send in your questions via the question box on the GoToWebinar dashboard that you should be able to see on your screens. Uh, you can send in a question at any time, whenever you like. There's no need to wait till the end of our presentations. Um, but so just do, do, do keep those coming in and, um, as they occur to you. So this is one of a series of webinars SITFA is organising, which we hope um, will be of help to SITFA members and, and any other interested stakeholders. Um, we're going to be examining some of the issues emanating from the current COVID-19 pandemic, which, of course, we're still very much, uh, we find ourselves very much in the middle of it. Uh, we had a very successful um, event earlier this week where we looked at the uh, some of the financial management challenges uh, within local government. Um, and today we're taking quite a different tack and, and we're getting um, up close and personal um, and exploring the idea of, of resilience. Um, so SIFA talks a lot about financial resilience, um, but it's also important that we uh, don't forget personal resilience or psychological resilience. Um, everyone on the front line of this pandemic is having to dig deep into their resilience reserves, um, particularly those perhaps in uh, leadership positions who, who will have to uh, take their organisations with them on uh, what might be a very difficult journey. Um, so to help us um, explore some of these um, questions today, we've got um, a great panel of speakers for you. Uh, we have uh, Rob Whiteman, who is Chief Executive of SIPFA, um, Kirsty Hanna, who is a Senior Consultant at Nicholson McBride Change, Amy Brown, who is the Stewardship Lead at CCLA, and Brenda McCarran, who is a Senior Consultant um, with SIPFA. So our first speaker, um is um rob whiteman um we've had a couple of technical issues which i hope rob was, is going to be on on the call um, um um rob are you there i'm going to hand over to you now no okay well ap apologies we're having trouble getting rob but we hope we'll have him back later in the session so what i'm going to do is go forward to our second speaker who is um, Kirsty Hanna. Kirsty, um, as I said, is, is is a consultant with uh, Nicholson McBride. Kirsty, just okay. checking a bit. Can you um, hear me? Yes. Are you are you on the line? Oh, apologies to the audience. Rob is now. Um, Rob is now on the line. I'm, I'm just going to introduce. I'm terribly you. sorry. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what's gone wrong here this morning. We've had terrible trouble, haven't we, Vic? We have, but we're live now, Rob. So we're ready for your presentation. Are you ready? I, I am ready. So hello, everyone. Um, I, I, I hope we're all being uh, resilient while I try to uh, get into this webinar. I've just got a couple of things to say and then uh, hand back to you, Viv, and it'll be interesting. Great to hear the other speakers. So, yeah, we're all on a journey with resilience. Uh, I'm on my fourth chief executive role and I've, I've probably been a member of top teams now as a director before that for 20 25 years and we're all on a journey and i don't know you know i'm i'm not at my destination yet uh, in terms of my own resilience but uh, here are some thoughts first thing is you know we must always remember that leaders cast big shadows and our behavior has a huge effect on everybody around us and we need to be conscious of our effects on their resilience as much as we're conscious about the effect of other people on our resilience. I think for leaders, um, it, I, I refer to uh, good fit is a, is a permeable dynamic, which is a bit, a bit waffly, but what I mean by that is we're usually appointed to jobs because, it, because of fit. Um, uh, people interview a number of candidates and they appoint the person who's got the right skill set at the right time for what that organisation needs. And we're mainly appointed because of our fit. And then we've got a mandate to change things. However, uh, the, the, the truth is that what the organisation needs from you over time changes. And we can't just be who we are. We have to 
adapt ourselves and get better at some things that we're less good at and tone down some of the things that we feel we are good at and this fit between us and the organization needs to be you know permeable and and dynamic um and in that in that regard where we're probably having to change the things we're good at and focus on and force ourselves to do some things we don't necessarily feel comfortable with um i think it's important to know you know am i am i behaving well um and do i know that do i know how people feel um i'm behaving am i helping their resilience am i am i making their resilience um worse so generally when i uh do my uh um sessions with my governance a couple of times a year for my appraisal uh, you know i i usually ask myself beforehand when i'm thinking about what to say um am i a resilient leader uh, am i coping with the challenges that the organization is throwing at me and to talk to the board the as my line as my line manager as, as chief executive about how I feel I'm doing and what's going well and what's going less well. But then really it's not all about me, is it? It's is my team resilient? Is the organizational, is the organization resilient? And then am, am I helping or am I hindering that? Um and I don't I don't have any great insights to then say what happens next. I think the main thing is to be aware that uh, my own personal resilience is affected by the people around me, but I have a huge influence on, on the people around me too and their resilience. And my real question as a leader is, is the organisation resilient? Is it coping with its challenges? And what's my role in that rather than you know just thinking it's all about my resilience and, and and anything else my final very personal reflection is um i've always been regarded by people around me as a pretty resilient person and i've always received feedback that i'm good in a crisis and uh, i i i behave well when things are going wrong however i've i've had times in my life where i became less resilient as a leader and the truth is at the time i didn't know it i only realized it afterwards um many of you will know i i was uh, uh chair of the uk board uh, chief executive of the uk border agency you know and i was having a pretty difficult time and um i was often on the news for, for all the things that were going wrong and at the same time in my personal life uh, my brother was sadly very ill and subsequently died. And I thought I was coping pretty well uh, with this. And after the event, I realized I hadn't coped with it as well as I thought I was. I'd changed my behavior. I'd got snappy. I would started to pull people out of it. Uh, I wasn't always working in a spirit of partnership with people, on which I hope I've formed my career. I'd become a bit bunkered and a bit paranoid uh, and got anxious about things that weren't really very important. And when it was all over, um, I sort of realised and reflected that actually I hadn't been as resilient during that very difficult time. And when I spoke to people around me, they said, oh, yeah, you were you were you were not your usual self, Rob, but we didn't know how to tell you. And so I think the one thing I've drawn from all of that is when things are really tough and I think I'm doing all right, actually, I'm, I ask open questions to people now, which is not sort of, do you think I'm doing all right, which leads people to say yes, but actually, you know, how am I doing? What, what do you think? Um, what, what's my, what's my behaviour like? Um, are you getting from me what you need? Uh, and, and that's all I've got to say, Viv, you know, it's a permeable relationship. People around us affect our resilience. We affect their resilience. As leaders, we must worry about the resilience of the organisation and our top teams 
whilst making sure that we're conscious that we might be less resilient than we think we are. Thank you very much, Rob. That was a really interesting and very honest um, scene setter for us as we go. I think we're going to unpick those, that idea of resilience in a bit more detail from a range of different perspectives now. Uh, just before I hand on to um, our second speaker, just um, to say we hope that we'll have some time to, um, towards the end of the hour uh, to take your questions and comments and so we'll, we, we will try and find 10 minutes or so for some, some discussion so do do send your questions in through the um the question box that you should be able to see on your dashboard okay um on to our second speaker who is um kirsty hannah um kirsty is a um consultant with uh, nicholson mcbride who are i suppose we could say business psychologists um kirsty over to you we are business psychologists, thank you. Um, that, that's exactly how we refer to ourselves. Um, and thank you very much, Rob, for, for sharing um, that story. That's actually uh, an incredibly perfect illustration of some of the things that we have found in our research. So I'm here with you today because um, as business psychologists, and we, work, we operate um, typically at the, at the top level in organizations. So uh, our clients are kind of executive teams, leadership teams, um, and executive individuals as well as kind of um, management teams throughout the organization and the last time that a, a massive crisis um, hit uh, especially a financial crisis uh, let me see if I can move this slide along oh there might be a lag there we go um, we, we were working with individuals at the top team and in 2008 when the financial crisis um, gave everyone a good time, we noticed actually that some of the individuals we were working with, some of the, the chief execs who were being put in really difficult situations and having to you know, steer the ship through um, incredibly tricky times, some were falling over, as you might expect, whereas others actually were really, really thriving and if anything really came into their own as, as leaders and um, started demonstrating actually even more um, uh, leadership than they had when, when times were good. And these were people that if you put them side by side, actually, they had the same level of intelligence, they had the same level of kind of respect and and um, followership from, from people in their organisations, they had the same uh, emotional intelligence. So, so there was something else at play that, that was making the difference between um, whether or not they, they really uh, thrived in, in that situation. Um, and, and we kind of coined that term RQ just to to keep going with the IQ, EQ, RQ kind of line up. Um, and, and essentially we said resilience is the ability to bounce back from what life throws at you, but, but can we measure that? Can we measure RQ? Um, so really briefly, and I'll do this quickly because actually the, the research, how we did the research is probably less interesting than what we found. But um, so from 2008, we started doing a massive literature review about everything that was out there in terms of personal resilience. And at the time we were, um, quite shocked actually to find that there was nearly nothing about uh, resilience in the workplace, resilience in leaderships, resilience in organisations. There was a lot about survivors of very specific types of trauma and it was quite clinical research, um, but, but, but nothing about organisational. So we then tapped into our network and um, did very uh, long and extended interviews with uh, 26 leaders um, who had shown themselves to be very very resilient so someone like Rob for example and we sat down with them and spent hours uh, talking to them about their experiences what they learned how they approach things how they think about things uh, what they think makes them resilient um, and asked a lot of questions that actually Rob had on his slide so we from that sort of distilled and created this, this enormous questionnaire that had kind of hundreds of, of items on it um, and once we had enough responses conducted a factor analysis so what i'm hoping has happened is that a lot of you on the call today um were sent the link to the rq um in its current state and and how it is today is much much shorter uh, because several factor analyses which we did not do involved other statisticians that that's kind of beyond my capability um so, so several analyses later we, we identified we identified the five key elements and we also managed to identify the um, questions that mapped the most strongly to them so that uh, we can make a much quicker questionnaire that, that actually very reliably um, measured the same things. So we've now got a database of, I think it's actually nearing about 40,000 now, um, uh, people who have uh, 
completed the RQ. So, so we're in quite a good position to kind of benchmark sort of individuals, but also entire organizations and entire industries against um, th this data that we have. And from all of this research, uh, the, the five things that we found were the most important in, in kind of um, sort of describing a resilient person were these. So I'll talk about each of them in turn, um, and then at the end, touch on um, the thing that, that Rob definitely was speaking about, which was as a leader, uh, what is it that you can do to increase this for yourself, but also to be very aware of the impact that you're having on these on, on other people's abilities to, to do and have these things as well. So the first of the five things is actually optimism. Um, and this was probably one of the biggest contributors to, to um, describing a resilient person. So optimism is obviously about seeing the glass half full. Um, it encourages people to feel positive about themselves, but also about kind of other people, about the world's general direction of travel. Um, and, and as a result, you feel good about change and you tend to be more confident that you're going to be able to cope with whatever it is that lies ahead because it's going to all work out. It has to. So because you're more confident about the fact that things um, are going to work out, you're also a lot more likely to be quite visionary, which is really important as a leader because you're looking into the future. Um, you're, you're assuming that there is a future to look into, if that makes sense. And actually having a visionary leader helps other people be quite optimistic about the future as well. So that, that, that's why um, we, we often talk about having a longer term vision is quite important during a crisis, even though a lot of people are obviously in, in kind of quite tactical crisis management. It's not to lose sight of that, that longer term vision as well. Um, optimistic people, when something goes wrong, they also they don't snap into looking for the worst case scenario. They, they are more likely to look uh, for ways to reframe the situation so that they can bring about improvement and, and focus on the things they can control. So optimism also goes along with a, a strong sort of self-belief and a can-do attitude. And that can-do attitude actually applies to the collective as well, not just themselves. Um, the word of caution about this one, and that this is what the last bullet point re relates to, I don't know if you can read it, it's quite small. Um, optimism needs to be pragmatic. It needs to be based on experience and self-knowledge and kind of reality. Um, when it's misplaced or, or when you've got someone who's blindly optimistic or really, really exaggerated, actually optimism can diminish resilience for yourself, but actually even more so for the people around you. It's very difficult for people to be optimistic if they think the person in charge is blindly, merrily um, leading them over a cliff. So it has to be pragmatic. The second thing is uh, solution orientation. So. I've clicked three times, I hope it doesn't suddenly <laughs> skip ahead. Uh, solution orientation is, uh, it's, it's basically, people talked about having an efficient early warning system. So being able to see problems coming a long way off and rather than allowing that anticipation to kind of really overwhelm and cause anxiety, it's, it's really just about planning solutions. So in this category, people are not daunted by the unfamiliar, by the unknown. So obviously this is a lot about um, displaying sound judgment, which is easier to say than to do when times are as uncertain as they currently are. But um, importantly, it's also about being decisive and taking timely action. I think in particular at the moment, indecision can cause not only opportunities to be missed, but um, more so it's creating more uncertainty for the people around them. So, so being decisive and being kind of communicative about those decisions is really important for people at the moment so that they know what it is that they need to do to contribute to, to, to moving that along. So resilient people very um, often talk about quite intuitive decision making and they, they're they not the kinds of people who will bury their heads in the sand because they're actually quite curious and they take real pleasure in finding solutions. They also know that the most effective decisions are those which other people are going to buy into. So there's really something about ensuring that um, whoever's involved or affected feels that they have been somehow consulted or they've been kept well informed um, whatever it is that you need to do to make sure that people around you feel like they've retained some control over their destiny so some of the client organizations we're working with at the moment um, what's not working well is either indecision or decisions with kind of no rationale no communication no the people in, in the organization don't feel like they know where that's come from and people are slightly shooting from the hip um, 
and they they have no control they're just kind of at the mercy of whatever's going to happen and whatever whoever's in charge decides next the next one is about individual accountability so um people who score very highly in in this bucket um tend to feel a very strong sense of sort of self-worth and self-regard which gives them belief in their own abilities which means that they're more likely to go and do something about uh, whatever challenge because because they believe that they can so so they often other people that are striving to be in control of events and to influence things that they can rather than um see themselves as a kind of victim of circumstance or or, or to allow themselves to be at the mercy of other people's whims so again, they tend to be quite excited by challenges. Uh, they view difficult situations as sort of interesting, unexpected diversions rather than kind of fate or final roadblocks. Um, and actually, sometimes, you know, we hear a lot of stories of people who are actively seeking out challenges that, that are going to daunt them, that are going to push them outside of their comfort zone, um, because once they can overcome that challenge, their comfort zone is expanded and their belief that they can tackle pretty much anything that life might throw at them <laughs> Um, is reinforced and, and that's a kind of very positive cycle of reinforcement. Obviously in this one a balance needs to be struck. So a bit like optimism actually. Um, Self-worth needs to be grounded, it can't be excessive because then when it becomes excessive and not tied to anything it starts to kind of look a lot like narcissism which really isn't helpful for the people um, around you. It, it, it start, ha has a detrimental impact on the resilience of the people you're leading. The other thing I would say about this one is, tempting as it sounds, individual accountability um, doesn't mean going it alone. So there's a lot of stories about, um, you know, despite feeling very personally proactive and, and seeking kind of control and, and influencing things that, that people can, um, that was always coupled with a, a very sort of great self-awareness of relying on other people, cooperating with other people, leaning on other people, trusting other people. So, so I think that balance um, is inherent within this kind of pie piece. The fourth one is openness and flexibility. So I guess that's not surprising to see that on the list. Um, anyone who did GCSE physics will know that, you know, that the bendier something is, the less likely to break it is. Um, so resilient people are often open-minded and flexible. They've, they've got this ability to, to tolerate and actually sometimes even quite enjoy um ambiguity so ambiguity is quite difficult for for most of us um but actually people who are very flexible and who are very comfortable with ambiguity and can see all the opportunities within that tend to score very well on this on this one um interestingly some of the the other sort of features of those people is that they are good learners so they learn from their success from their failures from other people's success and failures um, and they're good listeners so by kind of very genuinely empathizing with other people's points of view, um, they kind of get greater sources of information that helps them make decisions and recover situations and get good outcomes. So um, a lot of it is also about being open to, to different kinds of information to make sure that uh, you've not kind of gone blinkers on tunnel vision, you are still allowing your decisions to, to evolve. So again, this is about using experience to um, strengthen self-esteem self and self-efficacy. Um, I would say it's probably also about knowing to, when to move on. So in a crisis, um, I think in particular, you, you kind of have to um, <laughs> almost possess the ability and the permission to change your mind and even make a U-turn if necessary and new information has come to light. Um, and, and that's not a bad thing. That's not you know a reflection that your initial decision making was wrong or incorrect because actually it's just you know things are changing and therefore um th the appropriate the appropriateness of that decision needs to change as well but i think that in particular is why it's important for decision making to be transparent rather than based on pretending that you have all the answers because so one of our client organizations are really struggling at the moment because actually the the priorities and the decisions um, being communicated by the top team are changing too often. They're almost being too flexible and, and um, there's a real lack of kind of direction and, and, and uh, support for the people who are then having to go and act on the, those things. So again, the flexibility, but without it becoming chaotic for the people who are having to, to react to that. 
So then the last one is about managing stress and anxiety, which I kind of <laughs> think it probably needs very little introduction and very little explaining why that relates to um, resilience. Um, obviously, up, up to a certain point, stress can be a kind of motivational force, you know, something that energizes you to um, to act, to confront issues, to make things happen, you know, the, the deadline that helps you focus. Um, but obviously, we're talking about the kind of stress and anxiety where it goes past that kind of point um, and, and, and starts to, to veer on becoming debilitating. And actually, when you're getting to that level, I think the, the biggest thing that, that we have spoken about with, with anyone, actually, not just people in leadership positions, um, is exactly what, what Rob was talking about. It's that self-awareness and self-knowledge to recognise when you are in that state. And it's surprisingly difficult. I think people know when they're stressed about the presentation they have to do tomorrow what they don't recognize is when that stress becomes a bit more generalized um, and that anxiety becomes a bit more generalized and uh, the kind of crisis mode encourages us to not feel the feelings all the way through to not um, kind of really deal with our own stresses because actually we're dealing with much bigger problems is, is the thing we tell ourselves um, but actually if we can sort of and again there are tools techniques and, and this is something we spend a lot of time on in kind of group coaching sessions one-to-one -one coaching sessions but but if but if we can spend um some genuine kind of time and energy uh building that kind of self-awareness and self-knowledge to recognize our stresses to recognize um our own personal symptoms of stress how that looks cognitively behaviorally uh, physically you know how does it look and feel when i am in a stress space and how will i need to manage that now and also kind of in a slightly longer term and there's there's tons of research about that and as i say there's tons of uh techniques so so it is possible um but i would say that the hardest thing is actually recognizing it so looking at this model um when we're asked you know what do i do as a leader about all of this obviously build your own resilience first you know try and be seen to be a resilient and you know humane person so so it's not about being this kind of stone wall and and um not having any feelings and not having any stress and um having all of the answers it's about in a very uh genuine way being able to to be honest be transparent but actually be quite a stable stabilizing force for the people around you um and then the other thing is is look at these pie trips pie pieces and and think about what it is that you need to be encouraging or building throughout your organizations to um I don't know, encourage autonomy or to uh, involve the team in decision making so that you know they feel like they have some sense of control and input themselves um for example actually one of the client organizations that we're working with the um, executive team have been so in crisis mode that actually a lot of other stuff uh has been able to to be done elsewhere and, and the, and they haven't had to be so kind of central and, and they haven't been as much of a bottleneck because they haven't been able to. They've been focused on other things and actually because the rest of the team and, and the rest of the organization has been more involved and more in decision making and more autonomous, that's something that's a really positive thing that they've learned they can do and that they want to take kind of once this, this crisis is done, they want to take that forwards and then kind of trust each other and, and um, decentralize some of that decision making. So. What is it that you can do throughout this crisis to, to not grab all the reins, to actually give other people a sense of control over their own destiny? Um, maybe it's more about being compassionate and supportive and, and helping other people manage their stress. So a lot of companies are uh, focusing on wellness and, and, and um, health programs for people. So lots of opportunities and lots of questions to ask yourself how you can provide opportunities for, for these things um, to be encouraged in other people. And remind your people that you've weathered things like this before as individuals and as organizations because the more we overcome challenges the more we learn that we can overcome challenges and the more confidence we have to, to deal with the next one so i think i've probably spoken for long enough there's just one final slide uh, which i won't talk through but which i will flash up if i can get it there it is the sort of uh 10 step plan for resilience um which I will leave on the screen while I hand back over. Um, Thank you very much. I think that's the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> that was a really thorough exploration of, of what, what we mean um, 
when we talk about um, personal resilience. Um, I'm going to move on now to our, um, our, our third speaker, who is Brendan McCarran. Oops. Um, Brendan's um, a senior consultant and, and does a lot of leadership training for CIPFA. So, Brendan, over to you. Uh, thanks, Viv. Um, I, I, I'm going to uh, uh, fly through some things. Um, I spend my, my time um, either on things like the CFO Leadership Academy, which we've been running now for looking back on it, probably I started that 15 years ago. And in that time, we've seen hundreds of people in uh, tricky positions through um, financial crises and all sorts of things uh, up until today. The last couple of years, I've spent a lot of time with UN peacekeeping missions where they are multifaceted and the boss is normally somebody who's a very senior politician, maybe the president of the country or someone, uh, then as a general and then there's a, a police commissioner and so on and an ex-ambassador working in management teams trying to understand how to deal with incredibly stressful and ambiguous positions and situations. So. Um, these are, I guess, some thoughts about that. And also actually just um, building, I suppose, on Rob's point about personal things. My, my wife went back to nursing at the beginning of this year after 20 years apart and walked straight into, she's a theatre nurse, walked straight into a, um, uh, the crisis. So volunteered and is a, uh, at the moment an ICU nurse. So I've seen uh, sort of firsthand what's going on at the moment on, on that level, which is quite interesting as well. Um, let me just go through a couple of scribbled pictures. Um, so uh, when I say go through some scribbled pictures, just pick them off. Uh, first one is about capital, um, your capital of resilience, your reserve of resilience, our reserve of resilience. I suppose uh, if we look over the last few months, it sort of uh, when it first started, there was a huge surge of uh, stress, for want of a better term, and then it sort of uh, pales off and maybe it <clears throat> goes up and down a bit. Uh, over the period, but the, the key thing I think we need to look at always is the um, the sort of level that we can cope with. And at the moment, yeah, it looks looks great. But stress, I think, is actually something cumulative. And I think that uh, what we're really dipping into now is our overdraft sometimes. Um, and actually, that's that's the key thing. We're not we're not in the territory of uh, uh, bankruptcy, but a lot of people are actually on 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 the edge of uh, their overdraft, uh, and that's I think. Uh, can be can be a problem because it's been a, a long time in coming this the second thing is i want to think about where this stuff comes from just beyond just uh the day-to-day -day stresses of this new situation we're in um i think i want to just look at uh the wider picture if you like of the type of problems that leaders and senior people are always having to deal with so um Forgive me anybody who's seen <clears throat> me talk over the last 10 years because I tend to always come back to this picture. Um, if, if you like, there's a, 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 a kind of world of problems which I describe as type one problems and there's a world of problems of type two problems. In fact, all problems in the world are a mixture of the two. And if you like, what happens is as you become uh, more senior in an organization, uh, the type ones disappear and the type twos become bigger. What do I mean by these things? Well, type one is a very straightforward problem, a problem that um, when, in, when you see it, you know what the problem is. Pretty much everybody who's involved with it knows what the solution is and agrees on what that solution is, and the route is clear. The type two problem is one where ambiguity reigns, where uncertainty reigns, um, where volatility reigns, all those good things. People don't even agree on what the problem is, let alone what any kind of solution might look like. So what really in that field of, uh, to use the literature, unbounded problems where um, you're looking for some kind of accommodation uh, rather than a solution. In fact, you really can't have a solution to a type two problem. You just move the position to a, a slightly better place. And we can see this at the moment playing out in government because all the decisions that are being made uh, can be criticised from so many different angles, uh, but who's right? Well, it's a political problem, so there's probably no, no, no right or wrong answer. When we start our careers, most of the problems, the real world problems, when we look at them, if we look to them, uh, are made up of type one. They're fairly straightforward. There's only a little bit of the red stuff at the bottom. And so what we can do is we can spend most of our careers, early careers, solving problems and feeling that we've actually tangibly achieved something. What tends to happen though is, of course, as we move up uh, uh, and, and 
get to the top of an organization, the proportion of type one disappears. Um, it's still important, it's still important to sort of build the police stations, build the schools and build the hospitals just so the politicians can open them. But actually, do they actually educate people? Do they cure people? Do they make lives better? Well, there's lots of other things that do that. And those are the type two things. And those are the things which are not easy to uh, make a snap judgment about. Uh, but people are always pressured to make a snap judgment about. And that's where the pressure arises, because if nobody agrees on this, the problem, you get incredible stress at the top, potentially, because you're going to upset somebody. And sometimes it's the choice of uh, the discussion is about who, who, who can we afford to upset. And this is not uh, a normal kind of mode. Of, of, of acting for human beings because we're, we're group animals we like we like to uh, uh, be part of the herd and sort of uh, satisfy people the thing is we can also use this picture and somebody's uh, uh, already ahead of me with a, with a, with a uh, mouse there uh, we can use a picture as a sort of graph as well uh, look at the job size along the bottom and see see is perhaps our capacity to deal with uh, stress our resilience perhaps um, it rises, so the, the, the arrow you can see, or rather the, the two lines in the middle, go up as you go up. And you can have someone at the top of the organisation and they're operating quite well in a fairly less stressful time, a time of less change, and someone in the middle of the organisation, <clears throat> and they have a certain level of capacity, uh, and they're operating in, in a fairly good uh, space as well. Uh, the tricky bit is that if the person at the top decides they can't really cope, and what they tend to do, uh, in my experience, is they tend to start looking at the more tangible things, the things they were very good at, the things that promoted them into the position in the first place. And of course, that doesn't leave space for the person in the middle, who potentially could start doing the jobs of the people further down the uh, uh, chain, of, if, chain of command, if you like. And what we get here is we get micromanagement which is a stressful position for lots of organizations to be in. The other alternative is the person in the middle starts doing the job that they're not really qualified to do in the sense of qualification by uh, wisdom, qualification by uh, that experience of understanding that actually not everything is as simple as you think it is. Remember, most of us, uh, as we progress through our careers, every time we, we get to a more senior position, think, ah, oh, great, the keys to the kingdom are mine, I'll, I'll be able to understand what's going on. And of course, it's not necessarily true. Uh, and so it takes someone quite special to get to that sort of point. And I think really, when we're talking about leaders, we're talking about people who already, or should already be, capable of operating with a fair degree of ambiguity and uncertainty. Um, it's interesting, and uh, I was talking to a, a friend of mine who's a professor of sociology, and he reminded me that one of the things that happened, happens all the time in war, for instance, which is a great crisis, um, is that uh, the peacetime generals tend to disappear very quickly and wartime generals take over and are appointed. Uh, it'd be interesting to see uh, through the NHS, for instance, and through government, the degree to which there's going to be a changing of the guard. As people who are very good at dealing with steady state organisations um, actually uh, are moved out of the way uh, to take on to people who've risen through the crisis. The good news, of course, is that there's something called uh, system-driven leadership. That's to say that actually, even if at the top, uh, for a short period at least, we're not operating very well, the system, the governance systems we've put in place should still enable people to operate very well. So there's two thoughts about di uh, the diagnostic of what, what, why we're in this position. How on earth do we do something about it? Well, this is uh, from the work I do with uh, uh, people. Um, and, and things like the CFO Leadership Academy, we, we, we do something very simple and say, well, let, let's split our world into three things, uh, CIA, um, things we can control, things we can influence, and things we can, or for the moment at least, we have to simply accept. So C is control, I is influence, and A is accept. A very precise understanding of where the boundaries are is absolutely essential. I've seen people change overnight. In fact, I've seen people change in minutes doing this exercise in their minds. They suddenly realize that they're trying to do something, they're trying to control something that actually is not controllable or that actually is beyond their ability to even influence and is in the acceptable circle. So actually having an accurate view of this is important. And I think as people mature, actually some strange things happen in a way is that first of all, 
what we think we can control actually shrinks as we get older. Um, we understand actually that most of our um, uh, work should be devoted to thinking about how we can influence things. As Rob said, we spread a big shadow. It's an asymmetric shadow, as he said, because actually we don't necessarily see that shadow. Um, but actually it's, it's spread through the systems uh, and processes and governance that our managers put in place, thinking that that's what we want to happen. So con direct control shrinks. What expands, of course, and what we should always be seeking to expand is that influence. So how do you do this in practical terms beyond just using that sort of three circle thing? Well, uh, some of the things that what we talked about, I think you have to play a short game and a long game in a crisis. And in the short game, well, first thing is realistic. So that fits in with a lot of stuff that uh, we already heard about, being realistic about actually not all is bad, not all is good, but not all is bad. We need to be uh, have a very realistic view about what's going on. And I, I think the idea is not to think about having a constant narrative in your head that actually we're not up to this or it's a failure or it's going to go wrong. It's, it's being optimistic, but in a very realistic sense of optimism, which I think we've already heard about. The other thing is doing what's possible. Um, think about what you can do, not what you can't do. So it fits in with the what you must accept. Perhaps you can't do anything about, but there's always things we can do. They might not be the right things to do in the long term, but in the short term, there are things to be done. And indeed, uh, I'll come to this in a moment about organisational resilience, which I think is slightly different. Um, so do what is possible, be realistic in the short term. That's really important. And that's how we start with the conversations about improving uh, how we can overcome a, 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 a red crisis at the moment. What we're looking then is to the long term. In the long term, we need a vision. Um, I think we are appallingly bad generally at setting visions. Visions very often read as either some long list of things that maybe are a set of uh, outcomes, maybe a strategies or whatever, but none of them have uh, necessarily, or not all of them, have the power of uh, 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 rhetoric that really inspires people to focus on a brighter future. <clears throat> so we need to be working on that vision. And I think in the longer term, that helps for resilience because it gives us a future. OK, if the, at the moment things are not going well, but actually we have some kind of vision about getting us out of this situation. But, but for the longer term, things will be better if we can put in place various things which we can call strategies. But vision is important. And the other thing is to plan. And we need to plan now for that vision. We need to be working already, even though we haven't got enough time to uh, uh, bandwidth, I think was used before, time and energy to do this. Yes, you must have the time and energy because this is what you do. You don't live in the present. We live in the present and the future. We must live in the future because that's what our role is. It's to, it's to control, it's to manage, it's to lead the organization in that future mode as much as in the present mode. Uh, and the uh, final point I've made is that the bridge between these things is constantly be looking at your relationships and it's intimate relationships. So it's the relationship where you, you, you talk to your partner and have a chat about over supper about uh, what's been going on in the day, how it's panned out, all those sorts of relationships. We, we often have a thing in the CFO Academy, very often people talk about uh, 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 coaching by cocoa or coaching by chocolate where you're sitting down with a pal and having, having, having a chat with them. Those sorts of relationships, but also, of course, the wider relationships. By force of, for instance, us speaking today on, on a screen, we're not seeing each other. We're not having that human interaction. So we need to make sure that there is as many quasi-human interactions as possible going on. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine who's, who's a managing director of a, um, uh, an advertising agency the other day, and he said the one thing he is missing is the classic water cooler conversation. That's the thing he, he can't get at all. And he, he said that he's really missing it and finding that very difficult to deal with. So this is the, the practical page. What can we do to recharge our capital to make sure that although we're in, perhaps some of us are in overdraft at the moment, we've got a, a, a way of uh, uh, getting back into uh, um, some kind of uh, uh, um, balance, if you like. And the final point, I think, uh, and also this is a point Rob made about uh, it, it's actually just not not simply about personal leadership. It just needs to be. We need to also make sure that the resilience works 
for the organization. I wrote an article when this all started. Um, so this, this is now whatever six weeks out, uh, out of date, but uh, uh, and, and you can get it through publicfinancefocus.org. Um, essentially saying, get a vision, but also be really careful. One of the things that's happening in this organization is that people have done extraordinary things, fantastic things, and they've created new systems all over the place. Brilliant, no problem at all. Trouble is you're gonna to have to unpick them. And maybe what they've done is sub-optimize. So you really need to be onto that. And the other thing you need to be onto is, is looking at your communication systems. I would submit that lots of your pre-crisis communication systems are not giving you the information you need to, to, to manage your business. So um, there we are, those, those are some thoughts. I hope those are practical thoughts, particularly that previous slide with the three circles of CIA and some of those pictures are, uh, and ideas. Be realistic, do what you can, uh, have a vision, plan for that vision, and uh, uh, build and maintain and cultivate relationships. Thank you, Viv. Thank you very much, Brendan. That was great. Um, I am now just going to hand over to our final speaker, um, Kirst, uh, Amy, I'm sorry, Amy, Amy Brown, um, um, who is going to um, focus on uh, mental health in the workplace. Amy, over to you. Um, we seem to have lost Amy. Um, um, we'll try and, and bring her back if we can. Um, but we, we have, um, maybe we can start to the Q&A um, portion now, because we do only have a, a few minutes left. So, um, Brenda made a really interesting point about, about people missing the kind of water cooler moment, because obviously most of us are all working at home now. How, how I'd be interested in people's thoughts on how you can overcome that. How do you, how do we, how, how can we work on strengthening our resilience um, while we're in lockdown? Uh, we're, and we're, we are missing those those social interactions in the office. Any any thoughts about that, Brendan or um, Kirsty? Yeah, you... If uh, you've got to unmute me, excellent. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I think that's a really good question, and I think it's very practical things we should be doing, which is actually uh, conscientiously looking through all our little communication uh, apps and devices, including the old telephone. And, and go and 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 regularly going through. I, I've been going through and 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 uh, contacting people, uh, people I I, I um, see in the autumn where, where for, for sports, and I, I I we we we've been chatting away every couple of weeks, for instance. Um, so I've been making sure that I am still talking to people in a fairly regular basis. In fact, more regularly than I normally talk to people. Actually, some of the some of the people where I might only see them in September to to January, but now I'm. We're, we're, we're talking more, and I think that actually um, it's been tremendously helpful. For, for the, that that has been tremendously helpful, and indeed, the, the reason I was talking to my pal, the advertising agency managing director, was simply because we were going through. I was going through my uh, my, my, my cricket team, and we were we were just talking to each other, and that's how we made the contact. So it's not just work contact, but it's 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 having the um, uh, systematizing talking to people you might not have talked to for a while, and we we have so many ways of doing that through you know, text and email and so on so I, I would say really practically do that seek out people you haven't talked to for a while and get going okay uh, Viv can you hear me I can yes um I, I think um in a positive sense a lot of people tell me that they think the the new arrangements are working quite well across many organizations actually people often feel more regularly in touch because there is some formality in how often do we have to have one-to-one -one meetings how often do we have to have video conference meetings and that in many ways people feel that they know what's going on and that there are some benefits from virtual working in a way putting you more in touch with people than just uh, what happens in the office. However, clearly we can all go a bit stir crazy if we are if we are just on video conference calls all the time. And at the end of the day, people can feel exhausted. I thought Brendan's comments were really important about mix it up a bit and don't just be in meetings but network with people as well and and keep in touch with people and put in some of those more 
informal calls and sort of mix it up a bit. Don't don't spend all day in in the more formal video conference meetings that we're all living in now. They've definitely got some benefits. In a way, we know what's going on and a lot of organizations don't want to go back to how they were working before. But def but this thing about a bit of personal contact as well so that you feel in touch with people i thought brendan's tips were really good great um i think we might have amy back amy are you there hello no okay i think we're still we still seem to be struggling to um to get hold of, of amy um i can't hear her so in that case we'll just carry on with the discussion um just to add to, to what they were saying also on because i think rob just made a really interesting point about the video conferencing while it's great that we've got the tech to do that i've definitely heard about several people getting a bit of the kind of video conferencing fatigue and and you know spending about eight hours a day just face to face with their laptop screen not just working but actually kind of you know on video and and definitely mixing it up so so it's not just the social Hello? stuff all of us oh amy's back hi amy <laughs> Okay, um, maybe just briefly, Amy, um, we only have a few minutes left. Do you want to, to, to run through your presentation? Apologies for the, the technical difficulties we've been experiencing. Is she there? Hi, can you hear me now? I can, yes. Uh, right, very brief introduction. Um, I'm afraid you're breaking. I'm afraid you're breaking up. Amy, you're breaking up very really badly. Sorry, Amy. I think that's not working. We can't actually hear what you're saying. I'm really ap apologies that we aren't able to bring you the presentation from CCLA today, but we will be able to make the slides available and we'll perhaps be able to um, incorporate their thoughts um, in. in um, uh, apologies for that. Um, we do just have a few minutes left before um, we close um, today, so I'm going to hand back over to the other panel, uh, to the rest of the panel. Um, we have had some questions in. Um, one of the questions is about how, what, what, what things can be done to encourage someone else's personal resilience um, and any 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 tips for help and support to things other people can do. Or, uh, what advice would the panellists have have for that? Open for um, Sorry, Rob, go on, you go. No, no, off to you. Well, I was, I was going to say one of the things you can do is actually um, that particularly where it's embarrassing to talk about uh, because you don't want to raise it is to talk about it yourself in a sense um, actually rob did it in a way where he was talking and opening up that arena for discussion by talking about himself and then of course what happens then is everyone sort of piles in with their thoughts about it unconsciously the barriers have broken so people might be bottling things up uh, but when you say you know one of the things i've had a difficulty with is is the stress of uh, uh, being stir crazy in front of a computer and then when you pause, there is a chance, of course, that people will then fill that, whereas they're not necessarily going to volunteer that information, particularly if you're a senior manager, because that's showing, uh, in inverted commas, weakness. So, so, so talking about some of these things yourself, I mean, they don't have to be intimate things. It just simply needs to mean, you know, what a pain it is not to have a water cooler conversation, don't you think? Mm. Rob or, or Kirsty, any reflections? I, I'm, I missed one word, but I, I think I've got uh, the gist just from from Brendan's response there. But I think uh, I think that's spot on. I mean, self disclosure, um, kind of role models that for other people, it makes it very easy for them to share as well. And I think the other thing that's happening is um, in, in all walks of life, not just at work, not just with your boss, um, but people are asking each other how they're doing and how they're coping. And actually, we've we've been trained, I think, collectively now. Um, to, to answer that question rather than go yeah yeah fine how are you yeah fine we actually answer that question and we are opening up and talking and um as we were saying before a lot of the channels that were previously quite formal like a video conference um or you know a phone call with with your direct report or everything that, that was previously quite formal has now become 
more informal and and if you can kind of top and tail those with uh, genuinely checking in with people it becomes a really natural uh, part of that conversation you know, you, whether it's your direct report whether it's uh, you know other people in the business your colleagues whoever uh, and and there is an expectation that we will we will check in on check in on each other we will talk about that and we will share things yeah. that aren't strictly tax focused I I, 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 I I agree with everything that uh, Kirsty and Brendan said I think the other thing we can do of course is talk about what we think the end state would look like when we've got some choice in this what do we want to keep out of what's happening at the moment and what what might we want to change and we're all balancing aren't we with um what makes us a productive organization and what makes us uh, operate successfully but also how do we recruit and retain people how are we a good place to work where people want to stay with us and so i think talking to people about how do you think the end state should look you know, what are we going to keep? What are we going to change? What are we going to go back to? What are we going to permanently alter? I think allows people to think about what they like and don't like from the present arrangements and to open up a bit about that in order to visualise what they'd like the future state to be. Do you do you does, does, do you all as on the panel have a sense that this crisis is really going to kind of reshape working practices working relationships business relationships in quite fundamental ways or do you think we might all go back to sort of the way things were do you have a sense of i i think it's i think it, it's gonna massively change um the way we work I, I i think it is early days at the moment i mean i i you know i don't know i i think that um we need a bit of luck really and hopefully in the next year there's a vaccine or there are effective therapies and the economy can come out to play again and we have some choice in all of this to decide what what we want to do um to sub i think the only thing viv is until we're through this and we know the scale of the economic damage that maybe is being done and what the economy looks like the other side I don't think we know all of the implications for this for this year. I think all we can say is this is the biggest event I think of our of our adult lives. It will have a massive impact on public policy. A lot of that can be for the better, and we can be more effective organisations that prioritise uh, and and do what we need to do. But I don't think we understand all of that yet because this thing may have more more time to run and have even bigger implications than we think it does at the moment. Okay. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and actually, necessity is the mother of invention. So, yeah. uh, you know, all, all the, the new ways to connect that people have found, that organization, organizations have found, um, and new ways of operating are an opportunity to, as you say, al almost go from a kind of zero base, like if we were to reinvent it from now, from scratch, is this how we would do it? Is this how we would operate? Is this how we go to market, go to customer, do, our, do whatever we need to do internally? Um, and and it, it is quite a good catalyst to kind of break the mold. You know, the mold is broken. Therefore, well, let's actually have these conversations at quite a strategic level, as well as um, business leaders have, have a better sense of what can and can't be done outside their company's sort of traditional processes and 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 people processes as well yeah. um, and some stuff is probably not going to be that dramatically different you know the, the do more with net less principle um, was you know it is a constant was already and isn't going away and, and uh, so I think as Rob said it's a difficult question to answer but I think we need to be prepared um, for big conversations to be had but I think on, on an organization by organization basis you might see some quite big differences yeah, I, I mean, can I just add to that? I mean, a lot of people on the on the on the webinar will be finance professionals, and there's a really important leadership dynamic for us, isn't there? That our organisations will, in a few years' time, be in a different end state. And so, to use Brendan's um, analogy, how do we get the short term stuff right? But how do we play for the longer term as well? we have got to help our organizations get to a different end state 
and that will mean that things that were viewed as good are now bad and things that were viewed as bad are now going to be good and as finance professionals we have a huge impact on where how and when the organization will accelerate towards a different end state because resources in this are going to be key so do we have the information we need do we have the networks we need are we thinking about the right things i i i, I you know just to make the, the finance point there's a big role for us in helping organizations to get this right okay i think that's a that's a great a great point on which to wrap up because we we are um we are just slightly over time i just want to thank everybody again for joining us today and um, apologize apologize that we weren't able to give you the fourth presentation but we will be able to get the slides and hopefully we have quite a few more webinars planned and some around you know the similar themes and i'm hoping we, perhaps we can get amy back um to give her presentation there so so apologies to the audience and to, and to amy that we, we couldn't get the tech working um but this is a really interesting session thank you again uh, thank you to ccla for for supporting this um we will also be making um, a recording of the webinar available um, on our YouTube channel um, in the next few days. So if you missed um, any, pres any um, parts of the presentation or if there's anything that you would like to share with colleagues, um, you'll be able to access it there. We'll be emailing that out to anyone, everyone who registered. Um, yeah, I would like to uh, thank you all again for joining us and um, do check out um, um, the SIT for Webinars page and you'll be able to see the other event events that we have coming up and please do, do book on to any that appeal. Thank you again. <laughs>